Okay, so if you have to leave, don't worry. Um, I, the recording, there'll be a link to the recording in the content of the whole lecture. Okay, so I wanted to talk a little bit about some art shows that you could go to in person. Um, I'm probably going to go to Nashville tomorrow to an art show at the Frist Art Museum. And I think, I, I feel confident that that's a safe thing to do. You know, they are limiting the number of people and you can wear a mask and the people that are working there will have masks on. So I, I think it's not going to be any worse than going to the grocery store, <laughs> which I have to do every week anyway. So I'm, I'm going to go to an, a real art show. So now I'm going to show you some of the ones that I think you might want to actually attend. Okay. Let me find my PowerPoint. Okay. Okay. All right. So there's, there's two uh, shows that I um, think you might really are going to be really cool. Okay. So one of them is at Cheekwood. Um, it's, we talked about Dale Chihuly, who's a glass artist in the first lecture. Um, and Dale Chihuly's going to have a big outdoor show at Cheekwood in Nashville. Um, and it, I don't think the tickets are on sale yet, but they will be soon. I think it opens pretty soon. And as you can see, this is incredibly cool. <laughs> and I think it would be especially fun to go late in the afternoon there's a it, it stays open after dark Thursday through Sunday I think so if you get a weekend ticket for the evening then you can see the way they light these glass sculptures at night which is going to be really really fun I think they had Chihuly 10 years ago and I saw it in the daytime but I kind of wish I'd gone at night and that's what I'm going to do this time but it's new works that I haven't seen before. This is from 2010. Well, 2010, that's when the last time they had the show. Okay, so, but closer by, there's a really interesting show at the uh, Appalachian Center for Craft. Um, and this is a surface design show. It's a, t a fiber art show, like quilting, dyeing, um, clothes, and obviously, quilts and wall hangings that we see here in this slide. It's a, oops, my internet connection is unstable. Sorry. Um, sometimes if I move into my, closer to the modem, that helps. All right, so this is student work. Um, that means students who are studying textile art in um, their college, which you can do at the Appalachian Center for Craft. Um, and uh, so I think, you know, if you're interested in uh, clothing design or quilting, something like that, this might be a really cool show for you to visit. And the Appalachian Center for Craft is not far away. It's um, about 45 minutes or less from here on the way to Smithville. It's right on Center Hill Lake. So there's a link in your, um, in your, e-learn course to the Appalachian Center for Craft and the Frisk Museum, except if I have to add those links if you're in 052, so I'll do that today. But the other um, sections, 053 and 056, already have links to the Frisk Museum, Cheekwood, Appalachian Center for Craft, and so on, so you can get directions to those venues. And also, it seems that the Dairyberry Gallery on the Tech Campus is also going to uh, gonna have some an exhibit this fall, so that's good. I wasn't sure if they were actually gonna do that. <laughs> okay, so today uh, sometimes it's a hard to. All right, so today the lecture is about Chapter Three: The Elements of Art. So the elements of art are um, sort of like the alphabet of art. Like when you learn to read, you learn the letters. When you learn math, you learn about numbers. If you can read music, you learned about the staff and quarter notes, half notes, etc. So artists work with sort of a different vocabulary. And that is these eight 
elements of art, line, shape, mass, space, flight, color, texture, time, and motion. So we're going to go through all those things. And this is going to help you a lot when you get to, when you start writing your paper, for example, um, your exhibition paper, because it'll help you analyze the works of art that you see in an art exhibit. You can see how line, shape, mass, space, light, all those things how they work in the art that you're looking at. Okay, so first we're gonna talk about line. Okay, so obviously when you draw with a pencil or a crayon or whatever, you, uh, you're drawing with, you know, you're, you might make a line, for example. Um, and I think the reason I like to show this slide is that it, it points out that it's not, lines are Im important, not just to people who draw or paint, but to visual art generally, like photographers. Okay, so uh, Lee Friedlander was hanging out one day in Bismarck, North Dakota, in a fairly nondescript place. <laughs> it sort of looks like that area behind the uh, arcade building in, in Cookville a place that nobody would describe as beautiful or remarkable in any way, but because Lee Friedlander has an eye for lines, he was like, oh my God, look at all these lines. <laughs> look how many different kinds of lines there are. So in an in-person class, we would spend maybe five or 10 minutes sort of analyzing this photograph in terms of lines. Um, if you want to unmute yourself and talk about what lines you see here, what kind of lines you see, that would be great. So does anybody have an observation about that? Okay, well, if you don't want to talk, that's all right. So I'll just go through it. So you, obviously the power lines, <laughs> they're lines, we call them lines, are lines. The um, poles that hold up the power lines, the, the, I don't know what these things are, sort of supports for power lines, shadows count as lines, these cracks, these broken lines in the concrete of the parking lot count as lines. And something you may not usually think of as a line, but is a line, is the edge of something. And in this, uh, oh man, I'm gonna have to go back in the other room again. I can't really see my notes when I'm sitting at this other desk, but that's okay. All right, so um, you may not normally think of the edge of something as a line, but it is. And in this case, <laughs> it just so happens that the edge of this building is sort of outlined in black by the gutters and the trim and so on. But also, just the edge of this dumpster is a line. This little piece here on the... Even these um, guardrails are lines. So in visual art, a line is <laughs> pretty, it can be a lot of things. It's basically anything that's longer than it is wide. So, you know, if it's a guardrail and it's long, but it's not as wide as it is long, hey, it counts as a line. So it's not like math where, you know, a line is a, a, dis, a thing that starts a, an arrow that starts at one point and goes to another point. It's, it's much more flexible than that. Okay, so there, your book has this little um, graphic that illustrates the different kinds of lines, like the line created by an edge, um, an implied line, jagged lines, ragged lines. So, you know, kind of look that over in your book just to expand your idea of what a line is. So that quality, the different qualities of lines can kind of be used to, for expressive purposes. And um, you can see that here, like on the one hand, you have this kind of, this, these sort of flowing lines that describe the edges of this Japanese woman's kimono and hat and so on, but much more jagged lines that, that are not as soft and flowing are used in this woodcut by the same artist to describe the lines of a like a a warrior dude with a sword and everything <laughs> and so you get a much more kind of uh 
maybe violent feel from these jagged lines. They could almost like poke you like his sword, whereas her kimono looks kind of soft and cuddly. All right, so this is a little drawing that I made uh, a couple of years ago. Um, this moth got in my kitchen at night and it dried out and died. And later I found the moth and I looked it up online and found out what species it was. And I just put it on the table and drew it from a couple of points of view from the side and from the top using a little pen with a very sharp tip. And this just shows you how myriad little lines, this is called cross hatching, where I sort of drew the shadow of the of the moth and the markings on its wings by making many, many little cross hatching marks with the tiny little pin. So um, yeah, little li a lot of little lines go together to, you know, make make a color almost. Okay, so Gigo is an artist who actually used lines in three dimensions, which you normally don't think of lines as working that way. You think of them as working in two dimensions, like on a piece of paper or something. But she was uh, clever enough to realize that wire is a kind of line, which it is. I mean, if you play around with, you know, fine gauge wire, you can make all kinds of things in three dimensions and in, in three dimensional space with with a wire. So she would connect wires with little hubs. I don't know exactly what she used for her hubs, but I've seen some of her work in museums. And you can actually kind of walk around in this network of lines, which is really cool, sort of expanded version of possibility of lines. Okay, so now we're going to talk about implied lines, which is one of the types of lines that your textbook talked about. So in this painting, there's there's a line in the face of the green man. Why the man is green, I don't know. And it sort of breaks down in his nose and then starts up again, sort of between his nose and the goat. <laughs> and then it, this fuzzy line here sort of continues the implied line around here. And then the implied line sort of breaks down again. So why is there this implied line? I, I think it's to create a connection between humans and animals because the title is I and the village. That is, you know, myself and my shtetl in Eastern Europe where Mark Schall grew up. He's, people and animals were connected. So you can see a little vignette of a person milking a goat here. You probably, if you've ever looked at a goat, you know their eyes don't look anything like that. <laughs> they have really freaky eyes with these long pupils that are like a sort of a slit or something. But it makes the goat look more human, like he's, and there's, there's actually, I just noticed this for the first time, there's like a line going from the man's eye to the goat's eye, like, kind of like they're best friends or something. I mean, goats can be sweet, sure. Okay, so now we're going to talk about shapes. So obviously, if you're drawing a line, la, 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 and you come back to the beginning and you connect it to the beginning of the line, voila, you have a shape. Now, this is not from a famous artist. So it's an anonymous student painting, actually, um, that I looked at in a book about watercolor. So, um, but what, the, what, I think it, this is a really cool painting because this student took a complicated setup that is, you know, a sofa with a messy sofa with a bunch of pillows and throws and some kind of a plant maybe and a dresser with something on it. I don't know what, and kind of simplified it so that she could paint it. And she simplified it by making the, sh by simplifying, say, the plant into sort of basic shapes. And that's, that's what we do when we draw. We can't draw everything that's there. We sort of have to simplify things. And one of the best ways to do that is by looking at the shapes. Okay, so here's a painting that was in a show in New York about a year ago. The show was actually all about shapes, which is, which was great <laughs> because thinking about shapes has helped my painting and drawing a lot. I never thought about it until I did an exercise for a class where I had to sim make a painting mainly based on shapes. But, and it's not sexy like color or light or something, I, I think. 
the element of shape, but it's super, super important. And you can see here that Arthur Dove has, it's kind of abstract, you know, it's, it's a house surrounded by some trees called willows, but the trees, obviously it makes sense for them to be sort of biomorphic shapes, but he's also made the house into a kind of biomorphic shape. So what do I mean by biomorphic? So there's basically two kinds of shapes. Um, in art, geometric art, uh, geometric shapes like a square or a circle that don't really occur in nature. They only occur in man-made objects like, oh, say, maybe a spinning wheel. <laughs> I don't know if you could see that, but you know, a, a spinning wheel is a circle, <laughs> but most flowers don't, don't, are not perfectly circular. Even if we think of the center of a flowers being a circle, it's probably not an absolutely perfect circle. Whereas the spinning wheel has to be a perfect circle to work, right? It works like a bicycle wheel. So those are geometric shapes, circles, squares, rectangles, triangles, so on. But most shapes in nature, like the shape of a leaf or a rock or a wing or something like that is, is organic shapes um, or biomorphic, that is in the shape of life. And they're not as regular or as organic shapes. Okay, so I put this in here because the curator of that show, um, Amy Stillman, wrote this in the show. So as a painter, I've always had an eye for shape. Shapes define shape defines every outline, mass, and negative space. Um, and then to skip down a little bit, we don't talk about it much. It's not a hot topic in art, like color. I wonder if, in fact, shapes got left behind when modern art turned to systems, series, grids, and all things calculable. Was shape too personal, too subjective? And I think she's got something. She's onto something there. There is a sort of neglect of the idea of space, of shape, I mean. Okay, but I put this in here because I, this was... You know, we were talking about outsider art the other day, or really we should call it art, art by self-taught artists. And this was in a, a show of prison art, actually. Um, and it's by this guy, Wellman Charlehorn, who lives in New Orleans now, but he was falsely uh, convicted of a, of a crime and spent 20 years in Angola prison in Louisiana. And he started making these incredible drawings with ink on uh, file folders. That was the only kind of paper he was really allowed to have in prison for some reason. And he used uh, objects that he could get like bowls and apparently bottle caps sometimes as templates to draw. So he used perfect perfectly round shapes like a bowl for the body of this figure and then another bowl or cup for the head. And he just traced around the edge of these things and made these very intricate and sort of surrealistic drawings. He was later released when he was found to be actually innocent. So there's sort of a happy ending, but he spent a very long time in prison. Okay, so one thing about shapes, some of them are positive space shapes and some of them are negative space. So negative space is the stuff around an object. Like in this case, here's a drawing of a pair of scissors. The scissors is the positive space and the negative space is everything else, basically. The holes here, the table that it's sitting on. So in visual art, you when you're drawing, you have to think about negative space. You can't just kind of think of it as nothing. You have to sort of design it. And and that took me a long time to learn. I kind of ignored it for the first <laughs> few years that I was drawing things. But then I realized, hey, you know, my drawings and paintings would be better if I paid attention to, the, to sort of the shape around the object, not just the object itself. Okay, so one person who was really interested in that was Escher. You've probably heard of Escher or seen Escher prints. So in this case, he played around a lot with 
positive space and negative space, or you can call it figure and ground. So just looking at this, in the, at the bottom, the figure or the positive space is obviously a fish. And the negative space is, I guess, the water the fish is swimming in. And that's true until you get about to this row. And then the negative space or the ground starts looking kind of like a bird. It has a very specific shape. It's not just a kind of vague space. And then it turns into a bird. And then the fish starts to sort of disappear. And pretty soon it's all about this um, bird, this water bird, like a duck or a goose or something. And the fish, which was formerly the, the positive space, has become the negative space and just kind of disappeared. So that, that's an interesting thing to think about, I think. Okay, so when we're talking about work in three dimensions, like sculpture, we're, we talk about mass, not shape. Shape is two dimensional. It's when you're drawing on a piece of paper like Charles, Charles Horn. But if you're Botero and you're making a sculpture in three dimensions, we talk about mass, M-A-S-S. So, and this horse is massive, <laughs> but even if he wasn't, it would still be a mass. Like my arm is a mass. Anything that exists in three dimensions, or here's a telephone, that's a mass. Okay, so it exists in three dimensions. But what do we call the space then, the empty space in sculpture? We call those voids, V-O-I-D. Now all these terms that I'm using that you might not be familiar with are, on a, are in the content in a list of terms for chapter three. And I'm gonna make one of those for each lecture since I don't have a whiteboard. Well, I could just write, <laughs> maybe I could put one here, but you might have trouble kind of reading it from a, in, in this little tiny thumbnail image. So, so I made this list of terms that you can download before the lecture and you'll have all these terms in front of you. Um, because sometimes I can't see the chat. the chat. For example, the chat has gone away now and I can't make it come back. All right, so the holes in the, oh wait, I see the chat, yay. All right, so I'm gonna write the word void here. Okay, so these holes are voids in this Henry Moore sculpture. So this sculpture was on the campus where I went to college. And, the, and since it was outside, this is kind of a weird rule, but if sculpture is outside, you're allowed to touch it. <laughs> if, it's, if it's inside a museum, no. But if it's outside, not only can people touch this, but they sat in it. So there was always somebody sitting in this void, reading or something, or just hanging out. Um, and the voids are a very important part of this sculpture, I feel like. Okay, so, but what, again, what if you're working in two dimensions, like you're drawing or printmaking in this case, this is a lino cut, and you want to show the three-dimensionality of a mass, like somebody's head, in this case, a child's head. What do you do? Well, you use something called modeling, and again, I'll write this in the chat. So modeling is just when you use lines to create light and dark areas on uh, something. Let me see if turning the light on here was an idea. Nope, but if I turn this light. Okay, so now because I turned a light on sort of part of, well, it's not really working. Let's just look at the, the slide. So th the artist has conceived of this thing as like a a little girl, you know, eating a piece of bread and light is sort of falling on her face from her left and lighting up some highlights on her cheeks and her hair. And then there's these dark areas um, behind her hands and under her chin and on the right side of her face. And so that, that kind of gives you a sense of the mass of her body. That is her body exists in three dimensions here even though it's represented in two dimensions. So mass can be represented in two dimensions in drawing or whatever. Okay, so now the, a related sort of thing is space. 
So now we're going on to the idea of space. Okay, so you everybody has experienced this. If you're if you're in a building, you're experiencing architectural space right now, probably because you're in a, probably at home in a, in a room or something. So those spaces, those spaces that you're in are designed by somebody, right? The architect or whoever built your house. And sometimes it's, it's pretty, the design is not particularly remarkable. Like right now I'm just inside a rectangular room, but it, when you're in a, a building like the a Reagan airport in DC, which I've actually walked through, the design of the interior of the space is much more obvious and kind of remarkable, really. Because when you're in an airport, especially one of this size, the space can seem overwhelming, like it's not really human scale. And you're kind of lost inside this vast interior space. But the architect has kind of helped you here by dividing the space into what are called bays. So I'm going to write that. Down. So bays are just areas that he's defined by these columns and arches and a kind of a vault or dome over each bay that's defined by an oculus. That is a little window at the top. Oops, oculus. That's a, a, a hole with glass over it at the top. So for example, this terminal is a series of bays. And then he's also marked off the bays on the ground with these with a change in the color of the tile so you're not just lost in space you know you're you somebody can say okay you say where's the southwest ticket counter and they can say well go down three or four bays and it's right there on your left so that's that's what the role of an architect is really is to shape interior space Okay, but let's say you're, again, you're working in two dimensions. You're not an architect. You're just, you know, making a drawing. You want to create the, the illusion of deep space on your two-dimensional little sheet of paper. There, so there's a bunch of ways to do that. One is just by overlapping things so that obviously some things are in front of other things. If the things, if some things are smaller, then clearly they're, they're, they're probably behind the things in front. Vertical placement like it looks like this ball is further back on the table than this pool ball or whatever it is. And if you see a bunch of balls lined up using all of those strategies, then it looks like you're at the end of a pool queue, you know, and there's deep space behind that you're fixing to shoot into with the pool queue. But one, but the classic way of creating um, deep space in two dimensions is with what we call one point linear perspective. And this is a very important concept in this class. So uh, make sure you understand this. There's a video in the content that goes into it in more detail. But it, for, the weird thing is that for most, for a long time, nobody really knew about one point linear perspective or used it. But around 1400 or so in Italy, a guy named Brunelleschi, whose name I'll put down here in the chat, if I can get there. Brunelleschi was an architect, mainly. But he discovered that if you create, if you draw a horizon line, and this is the horizon, this isn't a Brunelleschi drawing. <laughs> there were no trains in Brunelleschi's time, but okay, you draw a horizon line. The horizon <coughs> is where the sky meets the ground. And then you draw what's called a vanishing point, which is where, in this case, the railroad <laughs> meets the horizon. Now, if you're actually on a railroad track and you're walking towards the horizon, it's never going to, the tracks are never going to converge to a point, right? But there's a sort of visual illusion that they do. And there's also a, a visual illusion that overhead power lines or fence lines if they're parallel to these tracks, that they're all, they'll all converge at the vanishing point. And this trick is what enables, say, video game animators, people who draw the backgrounds and for video games, this is how they make it look real. Like if you're in one of those 
first person shooter games. I don't play those, but maybe you do. And you're in a town, you know, kind of wandering around looking for bad guys. Every time you turn, the computer, the software recreates one point linear perspective so that it looks like it's deep space. And this, this was like a revolutionary tool for artists in the Renaissance that we'll, we'll get into more when we get to the Renaissance because they were so excited by this. It just made everything look so much more real. So Raphael obviously mastered this. Everybody had to master it. It, it was a sort of requirement for becoming an artist in the Renaissance. So if you look at this, this is a totally imaginary scene. And that's the great thing about one point linear perspective. You can just create out of your own head a scene that looks pretty real, like in a video game. Oh, my connection's unstable, even though I'm like two inches from the modem. Anyway, that's what Raphael did. He created this Italian Renaissance or Roman interior, and then he populated it with the ancient Greeks. So that's impossible, right? All these guys were dead by the time this sort of architecture came along. But that, that's no problem. Raphael created this imaginary space and he put these, well, kind of like paper dolls. If you took them all away, there would just be this space. But then he, he put these paper dolls back in the painting. So we'll look at it. Okay. So how do you know where the vanishing point is? The vanishing point, you look for what are called the orthogonals. Okay, so the orthogonals are lines overhead and on the tiles that converge at a point on the horizon. So the, the vanishing point is back here somewhere between Plato on your left and Socrates. No, wait a minute, I got that wrong. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's right. Plato is here and Aristotle is the guy in blue on the right. So between their heads is the horizon line and the vanishing point is right there. And, and all you have to do is draw, extend these lines down and the vanishing point ends up there. If you see tiles on the floor like this, you know that almost certainly somebody's using one point linear perspective. And these tiles are everywhere in Renaissance art because people were so excited about this technique. So once you draw the tiles, it's pretty easy to create figures that are the right size to fit in this space. I mean, you can basically figure out everything, what size it should be, where it should go. It's a, comp a complicated sort of mathematical thing, but it works great. Okay. Now, a cam this is exactly how a camera sees. Uh, obviously, in 1508, there were no cameras. There was something called a camera obscura, which we'll talk about later, but it didn't have film and it didn't have a lens, really. Well, it may have had a lens. But nowadays, when you point a camera at something, you're automatically using one point linear perspective because the camera sees with one eye, basically. Okay, it has a lens, right? If you can barely see that lens on your, on your phone, it's only like that big. But that little round thing on the back of your phone is the lens and it's like seeing with one eye, which is what one point linear perspective does. When Brunelleschi came up with this scheme, he would look through a hole in a piece of cardboard with one eye. Okay, so um, I put this photograph, which was taken just a few years ago in this slideshow because for two reasons, one, it was the 10th anniversary of Hurricane Katrina when I saw it in 2015 in the New Yorker. And that was a, a huge deal. This is one of the, this is the industrial canal levee, which was recreated after Hurricane Katrina. It was destroyed during Hurricane Katrina when a barge hit the levee and broke it basically. And water poured into the Lower Ninth Ward and that caused a lot of the deaths by drowning that happened during Hurricane Katrina. But by 2015, obviously, well, it didn't take that long, but they repaired the levee there and it's better now. Hopefully that won't happen again. But you can see, here's the horizon, right? This is where the ground on the, on the inside, away from the river, is, meets the sky. 
and there's a bridge down here. I don't know what river that goes over, but there's so much water in New Orleans, it's hard to keep them all straight. But the sidewalk and the bottom of the levee and the top of the levee, the levee's just like a big concrete wall, all converge at the vanishing point because Alex saw set up a camera on a tripod on the sidewalk. And, you know, the camera sees in one point linear perspective. Okay, but what if you're not in town? <laughs> you know, there's no buildings, there's no railroad tracks, there's no streets, straight streets or anything. You're just out in Overton County somewhere, or you're at Fall Creek Falls. How do you create the illusion of deep space in a drawing or painting there? So this is where aerial perspective comes in. Let me type that in here, in case you don't have your... As the name suggests, aerial perspective is created by dust and um, water vapor in the air. So you probably, if next time you're driving somewhere like on 111 or I-40 and you look in the distance and you see some hills in the distance, you'll see that they're kind of light blue like this. And the closer hills are brown or green and they're kind of darker in value. We'll talk about values in a minute. And so if you make mountains or hills in the distance look lighter and sort of more bluer or bluer, <laughs> then that makes them look further away. And basically the reason is because there is so much dust and water vapor in the air, especially in the humid parts of the country like here. So that sort of refracts the light and causes this illusion of um, that these, I mean, once you got to that mountain, it wouldn't look light blue anymore. But it looks like that. And that creates the, just the effect of deep space when you're out in the country. Okay, so now we're going to talk about light again, and which is related to some of the things we've talked about before, like mass. Okay, so artists, when they use the way light falls on something, to as an element in in a drawing okay and and it's in italian there's a fancy name for that chiaroscuro and it literally just means light chiaro scuro means dark so this the, in this self-portrait the artist has used light and dark to sort of dramatic effect you know and it, it and getting back to mass it makes you aware that his head is three-dimensional right? Because the light's showing, lighting up one side, but not the, the other side. And that gets to the issue of value. Okay, so light to dark scales, going from very light to very dark, is called a value scale. And it's really important, in, especially in photography, but even in col black and white photography, but even in color photography, it plays a role. Um, and we'll get into all that. But light can be a, a medium. That is, it, in contemporary art, light is used almost like a paintbrush or sculpture, especially by artists like James Terrell, who sort of made a, a career of using light to make art. And he, what he makes are installations, that is, immersive environments where you go and experience light in different ways. So at Roden Crater, which he's been working on for like 20 years, and I think it's finally open, you can go into these rooms that have an oculus. Here's the oculus again. There's no glass in the oculus at Roden Crater. When it rains or snows, moisture just comes in this space and drains away. And actually, I went in one like this in Dallas. The, 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 the one in Dallas was closed recently, but I got to go in it before it was closed. And it's like a round room with this, these seats that are really comfortable. They don't look comfortable, but they are, partly because they're heated. So you can lie down on this warm um, slab of, stone and look up into the sky which is constantly changing and then the the light from the sky projects this circle of light into the room that moves around the room depending on the time of day and magically while i was there this was so awesome 
it started snowing. <laughs> it never snows in Dallas. But that day it snowed a little bit and snow came in and, and sort of melted in that little room. So it was a wonderful experience and someday I hope I get to go to Roden Crater, which is out west. Okay, but Terrell has also created uh, works of art that use light as a medium, artificial light, in this case, fluorescent light. There's other artists who use fluorescent lighting to make sculpture and installation. This was at the Museum of Fine Arts, Houston. It was a tunnel that connected the two buildings. The Museum of Fine Arts had two buildings, but there was a really busy street between the two buildings. And so they built this tunnel so that visitors could, instead of crossing the street, could go underground to the other building. And this tunnel has these this colored light that changes colors while you're in there. So you're on this kind of walkway that like this man is standing on. And then there seems to be this blue void on either side of you that changes color. Sometimes it's pink, sometimes it's green. And it seems to go on forever. Like you can't really see these tubes. I don't know why they show up in the photograph. And so when I first went out on this kind of ramp, I was kind of scared, like, well, what if I step off over here where I just fall like 20 feet? Because <laughs> that's what it looked like. But it's actually just like six inches below and it's painted perfectly white. So these, the light projects a color onto the entire white space there. And it just looks like you're in the middle of this kind of white or it's kind of blue or green or pink void it's it's really magical okay so now we're this is the sexiest element i think color <laughs> everybody artists love to talk about color the other things are important too but for some reason color gets all the attention i don't know why and this is this is what's called the the color wheel um and this it's the color wheel is relevant to artists but I'm going to tell you something. There's sort of a caveat about it in a minute, but let's just focus on painters and the color wheel for a minute. Okay, so as you probably learned in elementary school, there's primary colors, yellow, red, and blue, and then there's secondary colors that you create by mixing yellow and blue to get green, yellow and red to get orange, you know all that. And then there's tertiary colors that are like yellowish green, greenish blue, and all that. Okay, but there's other parameters of color that are important to think about. These are the what are called the hues, the pure hues of the spectral rainbow. But color also has, any one color also has the character of value, like it might be a really light color or a really dark color. It also has saturation differences, and that took me forever to understand, but I'm going to talk about it in, in a minute. So a pure hue is very saturated, like this yellow here is extremely saturated. But if you mix it with the color that's opposite yellow on the color wheel, which in this case is violet, which is another pure hue, you start to get less saturated colors. So, and most colors in nature are kind of slightly less saturated. There's very few pure hues like this. Those are kind of artificial, <laughs> like, you know, plants, flowers, bird wings, <clears throat> usually in this range right here. Okay, so this is an example of real life color in action, you could say. All right, so you probably have seen all the goldenrods blooming around the place, like maybe around your house. So I picked some of those goldenrods and I made a, a tea by boiling them for like two hours. And then I dyed these skeins of yarn with them. But I got different results based on different temperatures of water. Like when the water was really hot, the yarn soaked up the tannins, that is the brown colors in the dye bath. And so this one on the right is less saturated because it's kind of browner. This one also less saturated. These are more close to the pure hues because I've waited until the, the dye pot cooled down to like 160 to put those in there. But this difference of saturation is also reflected in value. Okay, so 
if you take a, any color photograph and desaturate it, say in your color, your photo editing software, you can immediately see that, that uh, this one is also darker in value. It's less saturated, but it's also darker. And that's easier to see in black and white than it is in color. And so sometimes designers, when they're maybe getting ready to design knitwear, for example, they take a black and white photograph of their yarn <laughs> balls to see how they go from light to dark. Because sometimes it's hard to see. The color kind of interferes with your ability to see that. And here's the value scale down here. So you can see that these skeins were lighter in value and this one turned out to be darker in value. So those three things, hue, saturation, and value inter interact with each other. And you can easily see that if you mess around in Photoshop at all. Okay, but here's the disclaimer. <laughs> the color wheel does not really exist. I mean, it's useful for painters. You know, it's a great way to arrange the colors on your palette. But in real life, light does not arrange itself in a circle. In other words, there are blue, blue waves of light and there are red waves, rays of light and there's infrared and ultraviolet, which humans can't see, but Animals and insects can see ultraviolet and infrared. And then there's sound waves and all kinds of other waves, right, that have different wavelengths. But the visible spectrum is a line, not a circle. <laughs> the circle is just there for painters. It makes it easier for us to mix paint. But in reality, it has no real reality in physics. In, in the physical quality of color is, a, is sort of another topic. So light that falls on the earth has all the colors in it. That's white light and it's energy, right? That's what plants use to make food for us, for example. It's a good thing it exists. All right, so all the energy on earth comes from the sun, which, and it comes in the form of white light. And if you've ever messed around with a prism, you know that the prism can break up the light into the, the spectrum by breaking it down into its different wavelengths. So what does this have to do with visual art? Well, when white light hits an object, the object absorbs certain wavelengths, but not others. So a black object absorbs all the light. Like, here's my telephone again, an old-fashioned tel black telephone. Okay, so when light shines on it, all the colors just go right into that. But if a kid ever asks you, why is the grass green? Then you can say, because grass uses every, all the red, orange, yellow, blue, and violet as energy waves that to make chlorophyll, but it doesn't need green. <coughs> so it just bounces the green back off into space. So that's why grass looks green. It's kind of counterintuitive, but, but that's how it works. Okay, so, but getting back to visual artists, there are color schemes. So when you are planning an artwork, it's a good idea to have a color scheme. I don't always do this, but, so that some, a color scheme could be monochromatic. That is just shades of gray and white. It could be analogous. Let me check something here. Let me see who all, okay, are, are there just girls here? think so. All right, so Georgia O'Keeffe is famous for making works of art that evoke female genitalia. So if you've ever checked yourself out, you may recognize this as a sort of crypto clitoris or something. And she was kind of famous for doing this. And, and she kind of denied it. Like she would say, my paintings of flowers are not really about women, but they are. Okay, so she used an analogous color scheme here. Let me just type that in. So an analogous color scheme is where the colors that are used are on the same side of the color wheel, basically, like blue, green, and, you know, yellow is kind of next to green. So that's, that's one way to do it, one way to organize your painting. But Van Gogh was really into these complementary color scheme. So a complementary, I'm going to type that in here. 
is when you take colors that are on the opposite of the color wheel, like the opposite of this blue, beautiful, amazing blue color on the color wheel is this kind of gold color. So that's what gives this painting its amazing kind of punch is the contrast of these, these colors. Okay, so now we're moving on to another element of art, texture. So <laughs> this is a really famous piece and we're gonna get back to it later in the course. It's fondly known by Ball State students as the furry teacup. <laughs> but it was actually just called object. And later, another guy, not Merritt Oppenheim, called it breakfast in fur, but we'll, we'll get into all that. Okay, so you can see, it, this is real. It's not, it's not a photograph. It's like a real object in a real museum. It's a teacup that Merritt Oppenheim covered in fur and, and a spoon. And you can see that what's so disturbing about this teacup or this object is that you, the texture is off-putting, right? You don't ever want to drink out of a teacup that's furry. It's just disturbing. So the, the texture of the fur is everything for this work of art. It's, it's super important. It gets all its power from that. But even a painting can have texture. Like you think, oh, well, if it's a two-dimensional object, you can't you know, it's not going to have any texture, but Van Gogh put paint on so thick, like with a knife or, and I've done this with my fingers, actually. I don't have that painting anymore because I sold it on Etsy, actually. Um, but I painted one time, well, you're supposed to wear gloves when you paint with your fingers. I made a painting of a zinnia and, and so the paint was really thick and it, and it dried like maybe, I don't know, an eighth of an inch thick off the palette, so off the canvas. So if you go to an art show and you see a Van Gogh or some other artist that use really thick paint, like toothpaste thick, it's called impasto, just like paste. You can, you really, when you go up to these paintings, you, you feel your finger wants to touch them, and sort of verify that, you know, it really is, but of course you can't, you're not allowed. Some of them even have glass over them to keep you from doing that. But you can see it. You can see the, the thickness of the paint. So that's a kind of texture. It's not like you can't have texture if you're a painter. Okay, almost done here. All right, so the last one is time and motion. And until a few years ago, time and motion were not really considered as an element of art. This is something that was added later. I think because so much contemporary art involves time and motion. So you may not really have thought about it, but comic books are a graphic art form that deal in time and motion, right? And you know that when you read a comic, you start up here in the left-hand corner and you go here and then you go here and then you go here. So over time, a little story unfolds. In this case, Mr. Natural, who's a, classic figure in underground comics of the 60s. He gets hit by a car. He goes to heaven. He gets to heaven. He thinks it's kind of cheesy and he or corny. <laughs> and he tells God that it's too corny and God kicks him out. All right, that's the story. So it, it unfolds over time. But there's some art that actually does move. Um, it's, it's called kinetic sculpture and the people started making kinetic sculpture i think sometime in the 1960s but if you ever go to washington dc you should go to the national gallery of art and the i think this is called the east wing or i'm not sure anyway they built a huge wing on for modern art and it has this giant mobile i mean really like like a thing over a baby's crib except huge <laughs> like oops let me plug in i'm about to leave the battery so i mean i don't know i can't give you the exact dimensions of this thing but it's gigantic and it sort of slowly moves you know the air in the building is circulating and it moves these shapes around it's really mesmerizing to stand up on this balcony here and just watch this thing kind of slowly move because of the air. So Calder, Alexander Calder was sort of the person who put 
um, mobiles on the map as an art form, not just as a decoration over a crib. <laughs> so go see that if you can. All right, so, and then another art form that maybe you haven't thought of as art before, but it is, is film. And, you know, it's hard for us to put ourselves back in time to our great grandparents. Well, in your case, great grandparents or even more. Film came along in the t early 20th century when my grandparents were kids. And the fact that pictures could move just blew their minds. And it was called moving pictures, which was later shortened to movies. So I'm going to do a screen share here that I hope will work. Let me try um, a, different, a different thing. I'm going to show you. A, a, a clip from an early film called The Great Train Robbery. And something happens at the end of The Great Train Robbery that pretty much knocked the socks off of everybody who saw it. So, just the fact that people were moving around was a huge deal. This is like a, a Western where there's some bad guys who rob a bank and then some cops who come and get them. And this is the thing that blew everybody's mind. This bad guy shoots directly at the audience. He breaks the fourth wall. So <laughs> it wasn't really part of the story, but um, it, it had a huge effect on filmmaking. Wait a minute. Where? stop share okay and uh, uh james bond movies have this kind of there's a lot of homage to that movie and other movies including breaking bad which is too scary for me but apparently there was a breaking bad episode where a guy points a gun right at the viewer again breaks the fourth wall that you know between the viewer and the movie and shoots it so yeah, that, that, was, that was something amazing to my grandparents that pictures could move. And that's what film's dealing. Okay, so that's the end of the lecture. Now, um, are there any questions about the lecture before we go into questions about the class in general? Okay, I'm going to stop recording then. <laughs>